rise and fall. Kingdoms once strong, now shaken. We trust forever in your name, the name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. In all your wisdom, in love and justice, you will reign, and every knee will bow. We bring our expectations, our hope is anchored in your name, the name of Jesus. Shout it out, church. We trust in the name. We trust the name of You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear 
doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide. I am not a captive to the lie. stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your been strong and I've been broken within a moment. I've been faithful and I've been reckless at every been. I've held everything together and watched it shatter. I've stood tall and I have crumbled in the same breath. I have wrestled and I have trembled towards surrender. Chased my heart adrift and drifted home again. Plundered blessing till I've been desperate to find redemption. And every time I turn around, Lord, you're still there. I was found before I was lost. I was yours before I was known. Grace to spare for all my mistakes. And now 
This kind of love is who you are. It's grace I could never add up to be somebody you still want. Somehow you love me as you find me. If you want my heart, I won't second guess, cause I need your love more than anything. I'm in, I'm yours, your love's too good to leave me be. Your love's too good to leave me. If you Here I lay my burdens down. Lose my worries in your love. Casting every care on you. I have carried them enough. We're no here within his love, Emmanuel, he is still with us. When the world becomes too much, near the cross I will remain. Till every fear is still at the mention of your name. We're not alone here within his love. He Mercy is holy, holy. Lift up your hands, receive it now. 
here in the presence of the Lord. Mercy is holy, holy. Lift up your hands, receive it now. Here in the presence of the Lord. I know your past is broken. You can move on, it's over now. Here in the presence of the Lord. I know your past is broken. You can move on. presence, Lord. Thank you for filling this place and just washing over us and healing us from the top of our heads to the bottom of our feet. Thank you for being here in our presence so we can be in yours. Lift up pastor today and I just ask you to just fill him with your words. Minister to him. Speak to us through him, Lord. We thank you for the mighty things that are about to be taking place. In Jesus' name, amen. Almighty God, we come to you this morning. We just thank you for the essence of who you are in our lives, the very presence that uh, you have in our lives, Lord. And uh, Father, how we um, need to rely on that presence more and more uh, every second, every hour, and every day. Lord, it's so easy to become consumed by things, Lord. And as I was reminded by our brother the other day, that the birds sing your praises, Lord. That, Lord, they don't worry about taxes or their homes or what they're going to eat because they know that you will provide, Lord. 
And if we could be more like the birds, where we would sing your praises, God, not be consumed with the things of the world, and trust, God, that you will give us what we need. Today, Lord, we believe you're going to give us what we need in your word. I pray that you would help us this morning to just open our hearts to you, open our minds to you, and that, Lord, that we could truly desire uh, to encounter you, God, not just come here and get a one-hour fix, but, Lord, that we would come here and, and encounter you and engage you, and, Lord, that we'd be transformed because you are a transforming God, and we thank you for that. Bless my brothers and sisters this morning, God. May I get out of the way. Lord, may I um, only speak what you tell me to speak. So thank you, Lord. We praise you this morning in Jesus' name. And all the church said, amen. amen. So we just finished up our series, Patterns and Habits. And it forced us to look at things in our lives, to look at habits that we have and that we don't have, and the importance of getting rid of those habits that are hindering us, and then it, it, gravitating towards habits that are going to help us and, and bring us closer to God. And I have to say, over the first six weeks of this year that we've been going through this series, that I, I felt like I was refreshed. I felt like I had a fresh start. But then I kind of realized that, yeah, I, I did, but there was something missing. And so now that we've taken time to think about patterns and habits that affect our lives individually and then collectively in the body of Christ, the Lord showed me there's still one more thing that we need to look and absolutely change our perspective on. First off, how many of you feel like you have too much to do and not enough time to do it? <coughs> right? Isn't that the majority of people? I mean, do you ever feel like you have an, an unending, never-ending list of to-dos? If you could throw this picture of this car up. I mean, sometimes I feel like this car, right? I'm just <laughs> overloaded, burdened, got more than what I can actually handle. I mean, this was a funny pic when I saw it. But how many of you feel like this car this morning? Well, here's the thing. You're not alone, Almost 7 out of 10 adults feel they're busy or very busy. Here's the problem with that. Busy is never in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. I remember a pastor that I was under used to always tell me that if you're busy, then this is what's happening. If you could throw this up. Busy means being under Satan's yoke. Busy is being under Satan's yoke. We should be filled. We should be full. But we should not feel busy. And so when we're busy, we're under Satan's yoke. But here's the thing. Jesus said something different. He said, listen, if you take up my yoke, something else is going to happen. If you look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, it says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says something different. You shouldn't feel busy. You shouldn't feel burdened. Because if you're walking with Jesus, if you're truly leaning into Christ, then he says that, look, if you take your yoke, my yoke upon you and learn from me. Some of you this morning do not want to learn from Jesus. You don't want to learn, and then you complain about the stuff that's in your life. It's because you will not change what you're doing. Jesus, how come this? Jesus, how come that? It's because you don't want to learn from him. You want all the goodness and the blessing that comes from Jesus, but you don't want to learn from him. He says, learn from me. He says, what? For I am gentle and humble in heart. He says, and you will find rest for your souls. How many of us want rest this morning for our souls? Let me ask you a question. What if there were a chance to start fresh, truly start fresh? Not just a fresh start, but to start fresh and be completely refreshed. The title of today's message is Refreshed, How to Live Rested in an Exhausting World. Let's pray. 
Lord, thank you for your word and for what you're going to do this morning. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would teach us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, Last week we looked at Genesis chapter 1 and we talked about when Adam was created. And we talked about how after Adam was created that something still wasn't right. God had said everything was good, but when it came to Adam, after Adam was created, God said it's not good for what? Adam to be alone. So then he created Eve, who was exactly what he needed. Today, I want to start in Genesis chapter 1 again, and I want to look at something totally different, something that I think is going to blow your minds and maybe, just maybe, change our perspective on how God wants us to run our lives. In Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 1, it reads, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, and this is the first day. Notice something here. When God separated the light of day and the darkness, he says something interesting. He says, and there was evening, and there was morning, and this is the first day. We see this in day two, day three, day four, day five. God creates, he saw that it was good, and he calls it evening and morning. Verse 27 of Genesis chapter 1 says, So God created mankind in his own image, and in the image of God he created them. Male and female he created them. So now we see the creation of man. And then in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, it says, So God saw all that he made, and it was very good. He called it very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Genesis chapter 1. I've told you that Genesis, especially the creation account, was actually God's response to the creation account of the Babylonians. The Babylonian creation had been the predominant creation story since almost the beginning of mankind. God, God tells Moses to write this because he says, look, they need to understand that I am the creator. It's not all these demigods over here. It was me. Genesis is a book of poetry. Believe it or not, it, it has, it's, it's a, po a poetic theme in the writing. It also is about rhythm and repetition. There's a rhythm to everything we see in Genesis chapter 1, right? God creates, God says it's good, God says morning and evening, and it's another day. Here's what you need to understand. Rhythm and repeti repetition in Genesis 1, they show us something. Repetition, number one, shows us importance. Repetition shows us the importance of something. Something is important if it's, if it's repeated. Like, I'll give you an example. Let's say you pick up your phone and you see one missed call. No big deal, right? Your significant other, spouse, boyfriend or girlfriend, they may have just wanted to call and chat or whatever it is. But if you pick up your phone and you see 12 missed calls in seven minutes, you think one of two things. Oh, my gosh. There's something important that's happened. I need to call them right back. Or, oh my gosh, they're crazy and I need a different boyfriend or girlfriend, right? <laughs> Listen, when you see 12 missed calls in seven minutes, that means something important was going on. Repetition, repetition, repetition. And listen, repetition matters, right? God created, he saw it was good, there was evening and there was morning. Now, here's what I want you to grasp here. This is so important. Really, God says it was evening and there was morning, but for us, it's backwards. Evening and morning, no. For us, it's morning and evening. It's not evening and morning. That's not how, we, we, that's not how our day is run. We start our day in the morning and we start our day with work. 
And then after work, we move to rest. So in other words, when our work is done, we rest. And when we've, when we've done enough, we rest. We rest. That's our rhythm of life, church. That's our rhythm of life. We work and then we rest. However, for the Jews, the Jewish people, even today, right, it's different. Their day starts with rest, eating with the family, talking, getting sleep, and then they work. Well, what does it matter, pastor? Evening and morning, morning and evening, who cares? Tomato, tomato, right? It's all the same. Well, listen, if you're an Israelite, you cared. Now, when Moses wrote Genesis chapter 1, let's remember the background of Moses. Moses had been born to a Hebrew woman. Pharaoh said, kill all the children under two years old. Moses was placed in a basket into the Nile and pushed down the river. Pharaoh's sister finds him, brings him in, believes that he's been born of the gods of the Nile and brings him into Pharaoh's house. And so Moses is raised in Pharaoh's home. Then, Mer then Moses sees uh, an Egyptian who, who kills a Hebrew slave and he kills the Egyptian and he flees for his life. And for 40 years, he's in the desert. God sends him back and says, hey, you go back to Pharaoh's house and go get my folks. Go get my people. So he comes back and he leads them out of 400 years of bondage, church. So Moses is writing Genesis chapter 1. And he is pinning the evening and the morning. So what was God trying to tell his people in this? What was God trying to tell his people with the evening and the morning? He was telling them that they could never do enough. See, the first people to hear or read Genesis chapter 1 were the Israelites. And if you know anything, any history on the Israelites, right, God had delivered them from slavery, but what did they do as slaves? What did they do? They worked. But more importantly, they made bricks. They made bricks every day. You thought your job's bad? They made bricks. Seven days a week, sun up to sun down, they made bricks. And here's what you need to understand. Their value was based upon how big their stacks of bricks was at the end of the day. That's what their value was, right? How many bricks? If they couldn't make bricks, they had no value. The Egyptians would just, they would just kill them. The only question the Egyptians would have cared about is, how many bricks did you make? And they cared because every day they counted those bricks. So what is God saying, church? Yeah, pastor, you're not getting to the point. You're right. I'm peeling away some layers for you. I want you to start thinking. God is saying this to the Israelites. I'm not like Pharaoh. I'm not like him. I'm different. He says, you're not slaves. He says, you're made in my image. You're made in my image. That's how I made you. And basically what God is telling him is that there is a better way. He says, I have a different rhythm in for your life. Your day does not start with work. Instead, your day starts with rest. Your day starts with rest. The day starts for the Hebrews at sunset, typically around 6 o'clock at night is when they consider the new day to start. So they start with rest. Why? Why is it like that? Well, two thoughts this morning on why God's rhythm is different than what our rhythm is. Number one, to rest is to trust that what God has done is enough. To rest is to trust that what God has done is enough. At the end of the day, do we trust that what God has done is enough? I mean, aren't you glad we moved past that? Aren't you glad we're not like that anymore? In the thousands of years since this was written, all the advancement in technology and social progression that's happened throughout our lives, right? Uh, we no longer have to assign value to others and ourselves by how many bricks we can make, right? 
We don't have to check our emails six times an hour to make sure we didn't miss the boss's email telling us about an opportunity to build another brick, right? We don't have to see how many likes we have on a post or anything like that or, or how many TikTok views we have, right? We don't have to accomplish our to-do list. And if you haven't caught on that I'm being sarcastic, how about when you meet somebody for the first time, what do you do? Hey, Susan, how are you? Glad to meet you. Hey, what do you do for a living? Where do you work at? What do you do there? How many bricks can you make? How many bricks can you make? See, that's how we always gauge people. That's why I never tell people what I do. Never tell people what I do. I never told people what I did for a living or why. I don't tell people I'm a pastor. Because pastor, people will sum you up, right? Well, you can only make two bricks an hour, but I make 10 bricks an hour. So somehow I'm superior to you. We always are gauging each other. Always gauging each other by how many bricks we can make. And if you don't believe that this is true, look at your kids. Look at what you do with your kids. What are your goals for life? How are your test scores? Were you the, the, your test scores the top test scores? Were, you, were, they the, were they the best? How many colleges are you applying for? Oh, well, that's not enough colleges. We're always driving our kids by how many bricks they can make. This statistic startled me. 66% of millennials today think they will become wealthy. 66%. The percentage when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s? was like 20% of the population thought you might reach a million, you might be a millionaire. No, 66% of millennials think they're going to be wealthy. Wow. Like, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, I want to be Jeff Bezos. Yay. He can stack a lot of bricks, man. Or more important, I want to be Elon Musk because he has the most bricks, right? That's how our kids think. Well, where do you think they got that thinking from? Right? Don't blame, blame the millennials for how they are. Blame the generation that came before them and the generation before that. Right? Listen, here's the problem with all this brick stuff and the sizing each other up and all these things that we do is it's exhausting. I mean, if you think about it, it's exhausting. I don't, can't tell you how many times I hear you folks coming into the church telling me how tired and exhausted you are. And I'm thinking, what are you doing that's making you that tired and exhausted? Right? I get it. It's okay to be tired at the end of the day. But if you're exhausted at the end of the day, how much of your day was in the strength of the Lord and how much of your day was in yours? Because here's the thing, is you're never going to make enough. You're never going to make enough bricks. I can tell you, every time that I got a raise, I couldn't wait to get another raise so I could make more bricks. And here's the thing, whatever God gave me was enough for me to live on. But I didn't believe it, because I would get more money, and I'd spend more money. God gives you what you need. Sometimes he strips us down to almost nothing to teach us a principle of, number one, relying on him, and number two, how to steward his money. You're never going to make enough, and so you're exhausted, and you're worn out because you're always trying to do the brick game. <coughs> and here's the thing. We do this to ourselves, church. We do it to ourselves. The, the crazy thing is, is it's not Pharaoh that's making us do this. We do it to ourselves. I do it to myself. You do it to yourself. And we do it all the time. Hey, did you hear about that next promotion coming up? Do you want to take that promotion? Even though it takes you away from your family that is already well provided for, so you can get a title and feel better about yourself? Yeah, 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 I'm going to do that. Do you want to sign little Johnny up for five days a week, one-on-one -on -one basketball lessons? Because we see the potential in him, even though he's only four and a half years old. Absolutely, let's sign him up. Oh, my house. Oh, 
I just redid my house five years ago, but I got to redo it again. So you put the pressure of redoing your house again so you can make it the HGTV home of the year, right? And so you put all this time and all this effort in it. Why? I'm going to cook up meals that are made for Pinterest and take pictures. I'm going to get my side hustle on. Even though I make enough money, I'm going to go get my side hustle on. Ooh, I'm going to work on my body so I can look so good. Listen, we're constantly, 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 constantly trying to build more bricks in our lives and we don't even realize it. And what happens is our value is based upon what we cross off our to-do list and how many more bricks we've built. How many more bricks we've made because my pile of bricks isn't big enough right now and my to-do list man that's the most important thing in my life is my to-do list i've got to check those things off of my to-do list and i know about to-do lists because i deal with those all the time in my life right i mean if it's not in my calendar it's not going to get done i tell people that so my calendar i try to keep it as full as i can or i have a, a pad here that i write things down and i'm always Checking things off, checking things off, checking things off, checking things off. And one of the check marks that I use every week is the check mark that is checking off Sunday's message that it's been complete. And there are times when I'm working on these messages and I am frustrated. And honestly, I don't know why. I'm just frustrated. And on Sunday morning... Man, I I get up on Sunday mornings early, and I'm trying to rehearse and put things into my brain and all these other types of things, and and Mama Bear will come out and see me just pacing, you know, pacing, 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 and like, what's wrong with this guy, you know? And I'm just, I'll tell her I'm frustrated. I just can't seem to get the message to come together. Ah, you know, walking around. Well, I don't know if if you remember this, but a couple years back, I was sitting at the counter in my kitchen where I, I work at on Sunday mornings. And I'd been up about two, two or three hours. I'd gotten up super early that morning, and I don't know why. I don't normally get up that, that early on Sundays, but I was up really early. Mom Bear comes out, and, and inside I'm frustrated. And re- I was up early because this message was bugging me. Not this one, but the message I was working on. And man, she comes over to me, and she says, I love you. And I'm, and I'm proud of you. That was just, it was weird. That's not her. <laughs> right? Mom Bear comes in, gets her coffee, goes back to the bedroom, leaves me alone. And I don't know, maybe she sensed the struggle I was having this morning. Like, I'll tell you, here, I'll be honest with you. I'm going to be transparent, okay? Here's my struggle. Number one is, will the message connect with you? Is it going to connect with you? Is it going to make sense to you? A- am I going to be able to deliver it in a way that makes sense to you? Am I going to be stumbling all over my words? Am I going to be like, you know, squirrel and all over the place, you know? You know, will, will, will you like the message, okay? Will you like me? Some of you get mad at me over what I say up here, and I, you're angry with me. And I go like, oh, my gosh, why are they mad at me? I was just speaking the word, you know? And, but let me tell you something. When she said that to me that morning, I really felt like God was speaking through her to me. I knew God was speaking through my wife, number one, to encourage me, but to show me something else, that I was trying so hard to earn what had already been given to me. God loved me no matter what happened with the message, church. He loved me no matter what happened with the message. If I stood up here and just fell apart, he's still going to love me. If I say something that, that upsets you, he's still going to love me. If I say something that connects with you, he's still going to love me. God was still going to love me. He loved me. It wasn't based on what I was doing. It wasn't based on the performance. And many of us are trying to do the very same thing in our lives. We're trying to earn something that's already been given to us. We keep thinking we need to make more bricks because if I make more bricks, God's going to be pleased with me. God's going to be more happy. He's going to be happier with me. And we keep building bricks when God's saying, no, I don't want you to build bricks. I want you to rest. 
There's a ma- an amazing story in Matthew chapter 3, and we looked at this in our study of Matthew a few weeks back. And there's something I did not see before as soon, it, 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 that, it, that I need to bring out this morning, okay? Um, I totally missed this. So in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, it says, As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Let me tell you why this story is so powerful this morning. First off, it's at the beginning of the gospel. And it's the first story of Jesus we see as an adult. It's the first one we see of him as an adult. And here's what I want you to grasp. Before Jesus does anything, Jesus had done nothing at this point. Before Jesus does anything, before he heals anybody, before he preaches the gospel, right? Before he raises the dead, before he goes to the cross and dies for our sin, God says, this is my son. With him, I am well pleased. It's an example to us that we don't have to do anything to earn God's love. God loved Jesus. Not for what Jesus had done. He hadn't done anything yet. But God loved Jesus because God is love. We talked about that last week. And he loved the son regardless. And because he loves us regardless, we don't have to keep trying to prove ourselves. We don't have to keep trying to make more bricks. So number one, to rest is to trust that what God has done is enough. And number two, God's to-done list is more important than your to-do list. God's to-done list is more important than your to-do list. We forget that. We think we're so important in God's kingdom, like God is not going to function if we're not here. Like God is somehow, some way, going to be baffled if dumb, dumb pastor isn't up here blah, blah on Sunday. No, I'm sure that he would manage. I'm sure probably would find somebody much more worthy, right? God's to-done list is more important than your to-do list. And what has God done? And we have to take inventory of that at times in our lives. What has God done? Number one, he created you. He created you uniquely. You are uniquely his, and he created you uniquely. He didn't create you to be like somebody else. He created you to be who he wants you to be. So he created you. He saved you. Listen, every one of us were on a road to destruction. We were on our way to an eternity away from God. But God, in his sovereign grace, he sends his son to the cross to die for our sins. He opens up heaven to us, man. And now we have been redeemed. We are saved. We bear his mark in our hearts, church. He's healed you. Some of you have been miraculously healed. He had adopted you, man. Right? What did Paul say? That we have been adopted. That we have been adopted. We can call him Abba, Father. We've been adopted. We're his. I was adopted. I, I, could, have been, I could have grown up an orphan. But God said, no, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you parents who are going to provide for you. Not that I had the greatest family, but I could have been an orphan. I'm sure it would have been worse. He's comforted some of you this morning in your time of pain and loss and suffering. God has comforted you. God called you by name. Called you by name. Raised you up to do things in his kingdom. And he's gifted you to do those things. What drives me crazy is when people are not satisfied with what God has given them. I want to do this, or I want to do that. And it's like, just focus on what God's given you, because he's given you the gift to do it. You may not be as gifted as you think you are in an area once you step into it. Church, he goes before you. Before you get there, he's been there. And while you're going there, he's with you. 
This is what God has done for you. God's to-done list means we can lay down our to-do list. God's to-done list means you can lay down our to-do list. And church, this is what Jesus is talking about. Laying down your burdens. Stop trying to make so many bricks and being worn out. Now, I want to be clear. This is not an anti-work message, so don't get that twisted. It's not what I'm talking about, right? Evening and morning, right? They go together. We rest and then we work. But let me be clear. You are to be working. If you're not working, then you need to find out why you're not working. Now, what do I mean by that? Some of you may not be able to work physically. You can't go out and do a a 40-hour-a-week job. I totally get that. But you better be doing something rather than staying at home all day long, watching the television, right, and thinking about everything else everybody else ought to be doing, right? You need to be doing something. You can volunteer somewhere, right? You can make phone calls. There's things you can be doing. We were created to work and be productive. God created us to work. He called us to work alongside of him. That's the key. See, a lot of times we work outside of God, and that's why we're trying to build so many bricks, and this is why we're so exhausted. But no, God is saying, no, you, you, you've been called to come alongside of me in work, and here's the key. Not working for approval, because that's what we do, and I struggle with this. Oh, God, are you going to approve me today because I've, have I done enough for you? No, we work from the approval of God. We work from the approval of God. And when we do that, we start fresh. We're refreshed. Why? Because now I'm not working from a position of trying to gain God's approval. I'm working from the position of I'm working from his approval, and I know that God's hand is in what I'm doing. So the question is, what is rest? What does rest really look like? What does it look like? Well, let me tell you what it it is. Rest is whatever focuses us on the goodness of God. That's what true rest is. That's what true rest is. So yes, it can be sleep. Did you know that the Bible says that sleep is a gift from God? It's a gift from God. Psalms tells us that. I wished I had that gift because I don't sleep. I have a hard time sleeping. I pray and ask God to shut my mind down to help me rest. But I tell you, I'm up two, three, four times a night. And when I wake up, I'm just spinning. I'm not resting in God. And that's just being honest with you. I'm not. Rest that focuses on God is throwing on a worship song. You ever done that, man? Like, I'll tell you what, there's sometimes when I leave the church and I've had just a weird day, had a lot of weird encounters with people, and just I'm bogged down with 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 everybody's heartache, you know, and and I wear it because I love people and I care about people, and so it's not easy for me just to walk away from it. I carry it, and I'll jump in my my truck, and I'll throw on the uh, the radio, and I'll like, man, Lord, I just need to worship you right now. I just need to worship you, and so you know what song I throw on? Only King Forever. I mean, I don't know why, that just seems like that's my go-to song, and it's just uplifting, and it just, it just puts me in that frame of mind so that when I get home, you know, I'm, I'm already, you know, I can already be grumpy sometimes, but I'm not as grumpy when I get home to the bear, and, and so, you know, um, but yeah, a worship song. I'll tell you another one, a good meal with people you love. That's resting in God. It's resting in God. I love it on Sunday afternoons when my family comes to my house. Because I get my eat on. I don't do WW on Sundays. Sundays is my cheat day, and I don't care how much I eat, how much I, I don't care. I don't keep track of nothing. Just how much, how, I just keep track of what's going in my mouth, is it, you know. But man, good, a good meal with people you love. I'll tell you another one, reading God's word. I can rest in God's word. I love the Bible app. I love, I'm so glad we have that on the, on the, uh, on our app, or you can read through the Bible. How many times have you been going through the reading of the Bible and God speaks to you about something in your heart you've been praying about? 
It just comes out. You go, oh, wow, thank you, God. I needed that this morning. I needed that encouragement this morning. I'll tell you another good one is a belly laugh with a friend. Oh, man, I love it when somebody sends me something funny. Or when I'm with, with, with my sons or something and, and they tell me something funny. I just crack up. I'm laughing so hard. Another way of resting in the Lord is taking a walk outside. I love it when me and Mama Bear grab my dog and get the, get the baby bear and throw her in the little stroller thing, and we walk over to the Starbucks over at the nut tree and go get us a little something over there, man. And I just love walking with them. And it's so crazy because I don't, I don't talk much when we're walking. I'm just enjoying being out in the fresh air and just, wow, God, you're amazing. An intimate moment with your spouse, believe it or not, that's resting in the Lord. The Lord commanded a man and a woman to become one flesh. What do you think that means? And to, and to multiply. But those intimate moments that you have with your spouse, that's resting in the Lord. Prayer. How many times have you rested in the Lord in prayer? Or taken a vacation with people you care for, right? Rest is whatever focuses on the goodness of God, the goodness of God. Now, remember, I talked about rhythm, and I'm going a little bit long this morning. I'm sorry. That God had a different rhythm for us in our lives, and that rhythm is rest. So the question is, how do we include rest in our rhythm of life? Well, in closing, we include rest in three areas of our life. Number one, our daily rhythm. Our daily rhythm, evening and morning, okay? So at night, eating dinner with your family. And here's the key, talking about things of substance. There's a change. Talking about things that matter. Reading the Bible daily. Going through guided prayer. I don't know if you've ever done that, but you, you get a, a, a prayer uh, sheet and it guides you through praying for your family or your, or, or your job or whatever. Like I said, walking the dog or, or getting up three minutes, before, or three minutes before getting out of bed, you start praying, right? but having a daily rhythm that makes us rest in the Lord. We need to have a weekly rhythm. What's the weekly rhythm? On the, it says that on the seventh day, God rested. So for us, it's coming here. This should be restful for us. This isn't, this isn't a job to me. I don't come here and go, oh, gosh, i got to do my job today. I come here and go, yeah, this is great. I get to hang out with my family, man. I get to share what God is, is putting on my heart, and hopefully it, it, it resonates with you. The third thing is you need to have a seasonal rhythm. What does that mean? Celebrate. Celebrate New Year's. Go to a New Year's party. There's nothing wrong with that. Celebrate the New Year. Did you know that the New Year is one of the highest festivals in the, in the Jewish culture? The New Year is, like, they live for the New Year. It's a seven-day fiasco. <laughs> anniversary celebration man celebrate your marriage maybe you want to maybe you celebrate you've been at a job for 20 years maybe you want to celebrate whatever it is but a celebration a family vacation at least once a year go somewhere with your family or a couple of days outdoors church we need to have a daily and weekly and seasonal rhythm that brings rest to our souls to where we're not constantly trying to build bricks because, again, if you can put that car back up, right, if you feel like that car this morning, overloaded, burdened down, carrying way more than you should be, well, maybe it's because you need to look at your life differently and understand that God created us for rest first and then work. God says there's a better way, church. It's not just a fresh start. It's to start with rest, to start fresh, to be refreshed. And if we can learn this principle, that the day starts in the evening, reprogram ourselves so that we get rejuvenated in the way that we need, we will be so much more productive when we go to work. Your boss is going to be like, what has gotten into you? It's because I understand how the day was constructed. I understand that I'm to be different, that I'm not under Pharaoh's yoke. I'm not under Satan's yoke. I'm under Jesus' yoke. 
And he says, it's easy. It's easy. And that's what God wants for you today. He wants you to understand that his yoke is easy and that he will carry you through. Lord, thank you that you remind us that your yoke is easy. Thank you, Lord, that you remind us that we don't have to keep striving. It doesn't mean that we don't work. It does not mean that we're not productive, God. But it means that we keep ourselves in the rhythm, God, that you desire us to be in. That rhythm is different than the world's rhythm. But yet we want to so much be in the world's rhythm. And when we are, God, it takes us out of who we're supposed to be. I pray for my brothers and sisters today that they'd have an awesome day with you, God. They'd enjoy the time with their friends and family as they watch the Super Bowl and hang out, Lord. And that, Father, that you remind them that rest is good, but you're resting them so that they can work with you and alongside of you in, the, in your kingdom. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray and all the church said.